The recent announcements of PLIs and other related investment SOPs for the production of lithium-ion batteries and other parts of the EV ecosystem in India have been breathtaking. The aggressive pace has continued with the fiscal budget that was presented by the Finance Minister in early February of 2022, with firm policy announcements on battery swapping infrastructure for two- and three-wheeled vehicles. The policy objectives are clearly a massive shift to clean mobility by 2030. We already have determined on the podcast that the present buying cycle of ICE vehicles is likely the last one where EVs are not the logical procurement choice, and that when the vehicles being procured in 2022 come up for replacement in three or five years, the natural buying decision will very likely be an EV rather than an ICE vehicle. Unless the EV industry itself messes up the golden opportunity presented to it. As of February 2022, India has a few million electric rickshaws in varying battery technologies including lead-acid and lithium-ion chemistries on the road. There are some 200,000 electric scooters and less than 20,000 personal electric cars. The passenger car segment in particular has had very low penetrations with only a few OEMs offering EVs. Today there are only three in the market as of early 2022. New launches planned this year include the top end with the Mini Cooper Electric, the Volvo XC40 Electric, and the Mercedes EQA. At the other end of the spectrum, Tata and MG plan to launch new EV models in the 10 to 15 lakhs price spectrum. But yet, the choice for buyers is very limited, and there is a disconnect looming. So what's the go? What is the industry doing wrong, and what is hampering OEMs from keeping up with the hype that they have created themselves? To help examine this subject, today we speak to Cyrus Thaba. Head of Content at Power Drift, India's biggest automotive media house. My name is Ravin Mirchandani, and this is the Energizing India podcast. Cyrus, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you so much. First of all, you have a phenomenal podcast voice. Okay, <laughs> let's get that straight out. Um, you should do more voiceovers for Power Drift as well. You're more than welcome to come and join in. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure. I love the setup. And uh, yeah, let's talk EVs because it's something that I've been advocating now for a long, long time, much before Power Drift or my auto car days, for example. And um, in fact, my first, I just, just thought of this, my first ever video that I ever did on YouTube was an electric car, which was way back in 2013, sometime late 2013. So it's been a while. So that was the rave I expected. It was the E2O with the up, the midlife upgrade to the Mahindra E2. Well, not the four door, still the two door, it was a yellow color two door and it was the midlife update to the E2. Yeah, it's, it's been a while, it's almost 10 years now, yeah. So how was that experience? You had a car, 2013 electric, um, it's been, it's nine years ago. Did you think that uh, it'll take this long for the uptick? Honestly, yes, because uh, at the time we were really, really early into the electric game. Uh, Mahindra, of course, uh, op, well, Reva first and then Mahindra taking over. Uh, Chetan's projects and uh, the company uh, at the time for example of, of course there were no electric chargers in Bombay there were also in Mumbai you might be politically incorrect there <laughs> um, I had to charge it at the Dadar Pasi Kani Jimhana's pump room overnight which they were not too very happy about but we only had the car for a couple of days so charging it overnight and then sort of sneaking into the Jimkhana and removing the plug I mean it, it, it didn't make much of a difference to the electricity bill but even then the fact that you can get this instant power right at, at you know, sort of zip away from a stop line or, or, or from a signal and uh, have a very small footprint, which was great in a, in a city like Mumbai where the traffic is, is I mean, absolutely bonkers, still is. Um, it was great. And again, you know, quiet mobility. Uh, sometimes you just want that. It's, it's a more relaxing sort of commute, mostly. So sometimes you just want that after a tiring day. You don't want to shift gears a million times. You don't want to rev and then move and then brake and you know all of that. So it, I think I think uh, yes, it's been a while coming, but I think the next few years are going to be critical, and I think the progress in the next few years is going to be actually much 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 faster than what we think it will be. Even for us, although we give it a very relaxed timeline of say 2027, 2028, where it becomes much more mainstream, I think it's going to be much earlier. So coming from the um, we've jumped straight into the subject rather than talk about you. We'll come back to that. A far more interesting subject, talking about Cyrus. But you're from the auto industry, right? And um, when you when you consider auto journalism, it's about looking under the hood and seeing the four cylinders, the six cylinders, the direct injection, the torque. And yet, um, 
the EV industry is going to change all of that for even your sector, isn't it? What is auto journalism going to look like when you look under the hood and see a box? And it's a boring old EV with not much more that you can talk about. So I think there are two ways of looking at this. First of all, yes, as a traditional, and not just an auto journalist, as a traditional car guy, which I am. I mean, I have three-cylinder engines, four-cylinder engines, six-cylinder engines at home, single-cylinder as well. Uh, as a car guy, you will obviously be averse to the EV because, oh, it doesn't have an engine, blah, blah, blah. That's all nonsense. I think that's absolute. I mean, uh, I'm trying very hard to reel my vocabulary in. Um, <laughs> I think the car guy will actually, once he goes and actually drives a decent EV, will be a quicker adopter to the EV than the normal public will. From the auto journalist's perspective, I think we are on the verge of an absolute revolution because we're on the verge of uh, cars or, 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 or platform designs where the sort of the bottom end will be the same and then you'll have different top hats. So I can safely say that coach building is coming in back in a big, big way. Uh, resurrection of design is coming back. I mean, you are going to see some absolutely fantastic looking cars i mean look at the rivian for example it's such a beautiful looking design i mean I'm, I'm i'm not a big fan of pickup trucks let me put it out there but as a design language things that they've done with that car the space management is unbelievable look at the lucid air what a beautiful looking car look at the teslas for example i mean i, I remember uh, i remember driving a tesla in 2017 when the model 3 had 18 when the model 3 had just come out and it was like nothing we had in India. So I think from a design perspective, we're going to have that sort of new age boom come in. And again, there'll always be a need for an auto journalist, maybe not in the more traditional way. Like you see, I think the print journalism, and I'm there's no disrespect to my colleagues out there, okay? <laughs> but uh, I think the print journalism side of things needs to sort of end. It is more digital, it's quicker content that's going to be consumed, which we are, of course, uh, uh, in the space that we're at. Um, there will still be differences in electric cars though. Suspension setup will still matter. You know, uh, ergonomics will still matter. The way the car makes you feel will still matter. There will still be electric cars with souls. Let, let's not let's not count that out. There are still some electric cars which are still great. Like the Porsche Taycan is a perfect example, right? It's still, I mean, as an electric mobility tool, it's probably not the best considering the range, but it still makes you feel like you're in a Porsche. There are some cars that don't. There are some cars that are a little soulless. But, well, it's going to be a mixture as it is now. So I think the need for auto journalism will still be there. Uh, will it still be as mainstream or as romanticized as it is today? I have no idea. But I think that will continue. So there's two things that you mentioned there that, that I want to explore a little bit. The first one is design. Actually, both the questions are around design. You talked about how Tesla, Rivian, these are all sexy designs. And from your perspective, are these sexy because EV, this, e, the whole EV architecture allows them to be sexy? Or are they sexy because they need to be sexy so that they attract your attention, being away from the traditional automotive ICE vehicle and grabbing your eyeballs to come and make the decision to buy an EV? Um, no, I think uh, I think it's because of the because of the way because of the fact that they can be. I don't think they need to be sexy because if you actually look at sales figures for all the major electric cars, they still look like normal cars. You know, in that era where electric cars needed to look futuristic for the sake of looking futuristic, that's gone. They yes, they look different from what normal cars are today because automakers are still putting that effort to actually make a new range or new design language for their EVs, like Hyundai is doing with the Ionic range, for example. But look at the Mustang Marquee. It looks like I mean, if it, if it had a, if it had a normal if it had a normal engine in it, it would look like an a Ford SUV, right? Uh, Tesla, for all intents, looks like a car, I mean, more more like a crossover for the X and the Y. But the S looks like a normal car. It looks like a nicer Camry. <laughs> okay, and I'm not taking away from the Camry. The Camry is a great car because it does everything so well. I mean, it's a very, very comfortable car, etc., etc. Um, the Lucid looks like. I mean, look, we're also look, moving into a, a design language shift in general, right? Uh, some people are still sticking with their roots. Some are going absurd with their roots, like BMW with the extra large grills. But people like that. So I think we're going to be seeing a mix of design, and it's also because I mean, you have that. Uh, freedom to do whatever you want that space you don't have that lump of metal in the front which is the engine you don't have that drive shaft going down you don't need uh, you know sort of an axle in the back you can put wheel hub motors or whatever you, you know you can work around these problems and of course it is 
I mean, you can stack the batteries on the floor, and you can do all these things which, uh, which give you the freedom to do great designs. I see, I see some very, very, very pretty looking cars in the next 10, 15 years. So here's the rub. Then my second question on design is, you know, it's Elon Musk that pushed this entire industry down this road to EV. The traditional legacy automotive companies resisted. They were all petrol heads, diesel heads, didn't understand the technology, and now they're forced into this. And so today the EV is actually a retrofit almost on the same platform, right? So then you have the issue of batteries on the floor, for example, with the EQA, where I saw one of the reviews, which was very striking that when you sit in the back seat, it's in fact, because there's no drivetrain underneath and the, the lithium battery cells are, uh, are under the floor, your feet are so high, it's an uncomfortable position to be sitting on. Um, so why do you think we're in this position where we are retrofitting the existing line, just as you talked about the Mustang, but you have lots of inconvenience as a result for being an EV. Do you think it's because they're rushing to the market? Because it's completely juxtaposed to what you just said about beautiful designs coming. Yeah. Um, wh where do you, where's that rub? Yeah, so it is It is people rushing to the market because, uh, I mean, uh, I th uh, as of what, two months ago, I think Tesla was the highest selling car in the US and the UK. Um, there are certain countries in Europe where 50% is electric car, stuff like that. So obviously it is a big market chunk that the traditional automakers want to grab. Now, all of them were late to the party. Let's be very honest. The Mercedes group, the VW group for sure, uh, BMW. Uh, I mean, I'm not even going to start talking about Toyota yet because that's a sleeping giant. Um, but they have the technical ability to move things quickly and bring out an electric retrofitted electric car on an existing platform, which is what the EQC is, for example. I mean, it still looks cool, but it's an it's a GLC with an electric battery. That's right, yeah. But that um, life cycle has sort of now ended, and now we're seeing bespoke products coming in, like the i4, for example, I iX. What a... Uh, look, you might or may or may not like the design language on the outside. There's no denying the fact that that is a stunning car to look at. I mean, in terms of design, it's a polarizing car and design should be polarizing. Not everybody should like your design. That's the point of design. That's the point of good design rather. That's something that's scratch built as a platform, right? The EQS is scratch built. I mean, whatever C-class, E-class electric version will come. I and mean, when the E-class electric EQE comes. is also actually. Yeah, when that comes in, beautiful. right? Um, that, that's it. The E-class is Mercedes' biggest seller in the world. Mercedes sell, sold what? Two point something million cars in 2021. I see a gigantic chunk of that by 2025, 2026 going to like the EQE because that's where the actual market is. That segment of customer wants an electric car because not only is it going to be full of tech and range, but also I think at a point with those European customers, especially buying that will be more important to their image than buying a normal car. I don't think it'll be acceptable where buying and driving an IC car might not be socially acceptable in the within near, this near decade. Future. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Right. Absolutely within this decade. Absolutely within this decade. So, so let's talk. Let's talk about the sleeping giant. Um, and, and the reality is all sleeping giants, aren't they? Because first there was this resistance to come to electric, then there was this dichotomy of do you want to do electric or hydrogen? And so, you know, a few companies like BMW and Toyota went down the FC EV hydrogen route uh, and a few committed to electric like Mercedes-Benz, few were late to the party like Volkswagen. Um, and then Toyota was sitting in the middle, not quite sure, launched a Mirai in the, in the hydrogen space and now is coming very quickly into electric. What's happening in these big companies? What, why is there such a big amount of confusion on something that's imminently staring at them. Uh, let me add a third. Uh, uh, okay, let me let me say this first. Hydrogen as a technology is, I think, going to be very, very niche. I don't think people are serious about finding solutions to hydrogen as much as they're actually putting out in the public. Uh, and this is personal opinion. What I think is more viable as a solution for internal combustion are synthetic fuels. Uh, which is of course something that the VW group is like actively working on. Formula One is actively working on and when stuff like Formula One does something and once it gets into racing and is usable, the mass market catches on really quickly. Coming to the electric thing, um, yes, VW was late to the party, but what VW is going to do is democratize electric cars. Every, every review that you see about the ID4, for example, says that, oh God, it's damn boring to drive. But the normal person wants a day-to-day -day point A to point B transportation tool. And that is what that will be. When Toyota comes into the fray, the EV market will really, I mean, there will be a switch that goes from off to on 
the day a 500 km range corolla gets launched i mean i'm not talking about the indian market i'm talking about the international i'm talking about the us i'm talking about europe uh but yeah when toyota comes to the party and toyota will come to the party because that's what they always do but they they will come in ready they will come in prepared that no issues happen they will not be doing the test cycle on customers as we've seen some other automakers do i don't name who they are <laughs> but um but they've always done that you know they've always been a little late but they've always come in with products that are unbeatable in terms of what a car should be absolutely it's not something that necessarily will move your soul but it will move you and your family from point a to point b in absolute relative comfort completely reliably with great range so let's talk about the chinese then cyrus uh, two are on the road already the third's going to come so we've got uh, byd already haval's going to launch uh, what is your forecast for how that will change the indian automotive market do you think they will be incredibly successful uh, or do you see uh, a, some geopolitical concerns in in customers and they make decisions where is this headed right so let me let me talk to you about what mg has done to the indian uh, indian auto industry mg has been one of the have there been two disruptors in recent times kia and mg uh mg has been a great disruptor in the ev space and the ic space the mg zs ev is genuinely a great product okay uh at 20 something lakh rupees there are a lot of people who want to buy a creta or something a little more expensive but have the infrastructure capabilities to install a charger and they're buying the zs ev and the people are buying it i mean it's a just set a sales record personal sales record in jan I think and I'm going to be very I'm going to try and remain politically correct because I know there are implications to what I say there will always be geopolitical concerns over something coming from China because of what the um the emotion in the country today is whether that changes in the next 3 years or not we don't know uh whether i'd like it to change is something that's a personal opinion altogether and i'm not going to discuss it at all <laughs> publicly here or elsewhere uh but you know what um they have the capacity to uh, be successful uh it's 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 just going to be how powerful oh, sorry just going to be how good are indian or, or, or automakers that have been in india for a while not necessarily indian products are as compared to these chinese because they they always have this sort of edge on tech right at a good price point but if you can offer something with equal tech at 50000 rupees more then the indian buyer will buy that because see there's there's still this word of mouth thing in india right irrespective of how good a website is or how good a how good we make a review video the end decision will always be oh let me ask my friend who's into cars what car to buy absolutely right or, or i get mm-hmm. every day i get a, a 15 queries on instagram about should i buy this or should i buy that and people and i've realized that us as um, journalists have a responsibility to tell people not what we like but to sort of figure out what they need and tell them what fits their uh, use pattern more um and people do buy it and people have actually gone and bought products after we told so it's it's a great responsibility that we have but again i think the indian audience will maybe like indianized products a little bit more because see there is also a big troll population on the internet that makes it a point to talk about how mg is chinese irrespective of whether they've put in money in india or not i mean the mg uh, hector and the aster the aster for example is a very 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 good car for what it is i mean at 20 lakh rupees that interior is mind blowing i mean the leather quality is literally a, 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 i mean it's shit it's better than an e class uh it's makan level uh, maybe not makan level but <laughs> but like sub makan levels of of leather in there you know it's it's really good there are quirks yes but they need those quirks for us to talk about okay. if they just give us a normal car we do a review and then forget about it right we've been asking them where the car is because we've not had a car after we've done the first drive we want a car to drive around in we want to use that little robot on the screen on on the dashboard and see how annoying or how useful it is um So yeah I mean they've got it's it's not like they don't have the machinery to do it they do they have the price competitive competitiveness to do it as well but there'll always be this emotional value in the indian buyer which will make him buy a certain thing or not make him buy a certain thing so um let's stay on the subject of indian oems then and i i'm interested in your perception of what we are doing wrong 
there's only three cars as we discussed at the moment and there's at the other end of the spectrum there's a super luxury but there's nothing in between yeah um you know you have mahindra who were early movers yeah. as you said 2013 the e2o then they bought reva yeah and yet they are nowhere really on the cool. table today as an yeah. electric vehicle company tata came from behind it um they've got now the two vehicles that they've launched they've planned eight or nine is you know teething problems with them coming onto the road um what's what's the scenario here what, what is the industry doing wrong it's why is it also topsy turvy so i think everybody was a little wary about electric cars as an oem uh because they didn't know if it's said enough to actually warrant an investment of that size it's not a, it's not a cheap thing to do i mean it probably is cheaper than making an ev uh, sorry making an ic car from scratch considering how many fewer parts you use but it's still a car it's still many many crores um and today in the market in 2022 or 20 whatever uh launching a mediocre car just doesn't cut it i mean we will destroy it if it is mediocre we've done that with bikes we've done that with cars recently it just doesn't cut it i mean look at mahindra's progress in the last few years from what they were it's unbelievable today their cars are international quality cars period the xuv 700 is an international quality i would buy one 100% thar i would buy 100% look at tata motors their their punch is phenomenal i mean yes it's got a weak engine but otherwise as a product it's phenomenal and when the punch ev comes in that engine problem gets sorted So for Tata Motors, who's never had the best engines or the greatest engines, the electric platform is just a sensible thing to do because everything else around it is great, right? So your noise and vibrations, your engine performance, all of that just gets completely negated because there's an EV powertrain. Acceleration's faster, smoother, etc., etc. Uh, you know, it doesn't shake the car up, so it's just a better product that people are more comfortable in. So for Tata, they're doing exactly what they need to do. We know the Altros EV is coming this year. Great product. I mean, the Altros again struggles because of an engine. Everything around it is beautiful. I mean, looks great. I mean, it looks futuristic even today. Uh, I'm sure in whatever silver or white with the blue accents, it'll look even better. What people are doing wrong, though, I think, is they've been too conservative in the last few years. Now they've realized suddenly with the Nexon's success story that oh no, we should have done more, which means now they're putting in a lot more effort. the negative side of that effort is they might rush to the market but with evs there's not much you can do wrong with an engine there's a lot you can do wrong you can make an absolute turd of an engine and evs and i mean you can literally buy technology and put it in you don't have to invest money into making a motor from scratch making battery packs from scratch plus all these things are anyways things you buy from people who specialize in these things so i think uh, uh that's what people are not not paid i think the timing's been a little off But I think the Indian auto industry has always been a few years behind the curve, but that curve is much, much smaller now. Uh, what we were, I mean, fifteen, twenty years behind the curve at one point of time. Maybe not that much. Maybe ten years. Uh, I think it's down to two years, three years at the most. When Mahindra comes in with their electric SUV, we know it'll be great because the three double O XUV three double O is around it a great platform. Uh, and Mahindra's always put an emphasis on driving performance. So maybe not great range, but at least it'll drive really well. So that'll be a trade-off. Uh, Maruti, we know, will come in with mass market, absolute bang on, just what you need when it comes in. So I think conservative conservativeness is what's uh, uh, been eating them up. And I don't see any other manufacturers in India really. I mean, Kia will obviously, Hyundai will improve their electric uh, portfolio, but probably Hyundai will move up in the range and not down. because they have that product ready the ionic 5 ionic iconic yeah ionic that's a great car I mean, that looks really cool and it's not as small as it looks in the pictures the big car uh but yeah i think this uh, uh i think there's so much potential for everybody at every price point and i i don't think we will see many i don't think we'll see a five like rupee electric vehicle so there are two companies that you talk about the two powerhouses of indian automotive tata and mahindra And these are the companies to watch, and these are the companies that are most most exciting as well, and make us very proud because both of absolutely, them have come out of the bank. The, yeah. the Nexon, as you said, is an international quality car, and when you look at all the latest Mahindras, my God, I've, I've driven the Thar. What a, what a vehicle! Yeah. The SUV 700 brings tears to your eyes in terms of pride just to see an Indian Indian I mean, product. It's, it's just, yeah. What's changed in both of these companies that they've come out? They've come out of the closet almost, so to speak, with the bang. <laughs> 
So I think with with uh, Tata, it's been a gradual improvement. Every Tata product is the best Tata yet. The the Hector was the best Tata yet. Sorry, uh, the Harrier. Oh my God, the Harrier was the best Tata yet. The Altros then was the best Tata yet. The next one before it, the Safari was the best Tata yet. The Punch now today, in my opinion, is the best Tata yet. Uh, don't get me wrong, the Safari is great, and what they're offering as options in the Safari as well. It's not just one car and one package. You can have five different variations of the top end, five different interior options, five different color choices. It's crazy. Tata has been a gradual move up. Tata also is a little less. Uh, this is because I know how Tata works internally. Uh, Tata is a little less averse to change, or was a little less averse to change in the past. I'm hoping it isn't anymore. Um, well, we've seen some great improvements from Tata Motors every year, year on year. We know that their cars will be good cars. And their perception of how they are in the market has changed. So today people are going and buying one, not worried about how rubbish the service will be because it isn't that bad anymore. Mm, true. Look, every every service center in the country is as good or as bad as the mm. other one. Okay. Which is why I don't give my cars to any service. Well, I don't drive new cars also. That's a different thing. <laughs> um, Mahindra, on the other hand, has been a revolution. Uh, I think there are some very forward-thinking people involved. Um, Anand, of course, gives the uh, Mr. Mahindra. Anand gives uh, the freedom to the team to actually think and do stuff. There is, there are, there are brilliances of auto passion in that company, which is lacking in a lot of other companies. There are people who are genuinely. Oh, there are a lot of people who are actually genuinely interested in cars in Mahindra today as compared to almost any other automaker in the country. Okay, it is a car. If, if you were a car guy and you want to work in an automaker in the country, that's probably where you work. And I've had several friends move from the journalism side to the to the sort of marketing or to the product development, etc, etc side and they're all happy there. Um, and Mahindra also has had that freedom of, you know, being a slightly more uh, agile company. Mm -hmm. Maybe not in the past, but definitely we're seeing that agility come in now. And they have that heritage to fall back on, right? They've got some really cool heritage to fall back on, like the the, the, the Jeep heritage and stuff like that. But they make, they make the most use of it. I mean, look at the Thar. At the end of the day, it is a reimagined Jeep, right? But it is cool in its own right. And it's a very, very cool car. It is very cool. And with the XUV, they've just literally, they've taken their time. It's been years since we've seen the mules. I mean, that's been an internet joke, isn't it? Yeah. The XUV the Scorpio, for example, is now it's it's an internet meme. Mm. Uh, we'll have what the coronavirus will end before the Scorpio gets launched is what mm -hmm. the, the meme is the last meme. But that's not bad. Yeah. Let them do their testing because it sort of irons out uh, the issues in these cars because these cars are packing a lot of tech. And they're tuned to Indian roads really well. I mean, the ADAS in, this, in the XUV 700 is the... Okay, I'm going to say this with authority and on the record. It's the best ADAS I have ever driven in my life. Period. And I've driven Teslas. And I've driven Volvos. And I've driven Merc uh, ADAS stuff. And this is the for the Indian market. It's the It actually works. It, it's basically a friend just tapping on the back and say, don't do that. Just chill. And you, so you sort of reel back a little bit. And that's what it does. It doesn't go and just slam on the brakes like a lunatic and makes you wonder what happened. It just gently taps the brakes and reminds you that there's something about to happen. And then you sort of take over. And if you don't take over, it does slam on the brakes. Um, uh, so it's these kind of improvements that they've done. Now, why it's happened is obviously something that we don't really know. But it's obviously been uh, money being pumped in, ideas being opened up, uh, ease of actually making things happen, probably. Uh, yeah, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of young blood in mind too. So, sorry, staying with the theme of things that um, we're doing wrong. <clears throat> um, one of our worries is that the, the EV industry is in danger of a hype and a bubble being burst, you know, as performance uh, doesn't keep up with promises that are being made. Uh, by some of the, particularly the startups who are seeking significant funding. Uh, for example, take Ola, biggest <laughs> factory for electric vehicles in the world. 
and then struggling to deliver the first few thousand electric scooters, which then couldn't be charged because the charging network wasn't ready. And then they're teasing a launch of a new electric oh, you're car. Oh, you get me in trouble now. Um, so, and well, that's just one example. There's many other <laughs> bubbles that are being created. People are funding huge amounts of money. Yeah. And what I worry about is we will have, this happens every 10 years. There yes. was a telecom bubble, there was the internet bubble, and it gets busted. And then people with real ideas and real passion and real capability to deliver don't get funded because mm -hmm. the hype that was early on in the piece sucked up all the money and all the confidence and all the trust. So what's your perception right. of this? You, you, you spoke about how this happens every 10 years. Hmm. The auto industry has had this happen in the past. If you look at the uh, 20th century, the early 15, 20, 30 years of the 20th century, right? We had a thousand automakers, 15, 2000, 3000 automakers. I don't even know. I mean, every third person had an auto, uh, had a car. Uh, everybody was doing everything. I mean, there were crazy ideas. You know, there were electric cars back then, which were, which were. I mean, sometimes they predate some really pro popular uh, IC cars. Uh, hybrid, diesel. Front wheel drive, rear wheel drive, all wheel drive, blah, 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 V10, V16, I don't know, straight 24 cylinder, God knows. Everybody was doing everything. We're in the same zone. Because there is a chance for somebody who is a small player to hit it big. Uh, who knew Microsoft, who knew Apple would be Apple when they started? Who knew Facebook would be Facebook when they started, right? I mean, every time I see the, that movie, The Social Network, I'm just, I'm, it's, it's unbelievable what Mark Zuckerberg has done. Today, there's a chance for a small, smart human being to come up with a concept and make it work. Which is why you're seeing these startups come in. The problem is, and there will always be this, this, this yin and yang, is for that one person, there will always be 10 dumb beeps <laughs> trying to take advantage of the system. I know for a fact, when we get... New, I mean, press releases. I look at them and I'm like, dude, this is a scam. There are so many automakers today. You know, the best thing in the world. I, I, so, okay, let me give you this sort of, let me just uh, uh, turn back time a little bit, okay? When I was in Delhi, I stayed in Delhi for three years, two and a half. Um, I was at NDTV and one of the things I would cover is the uh, EV Expo, right? And I was, uh, got a call from the PR lady one day and she said, so we want you to come and cover the EV Expo. It's like the biggest electric car, electric vehicle show in the country, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, so how cool, where is it? It's at Pragati Man. I'm like, oh, sweet, you know, it's, it's the birthplace of the expo. Uh, yeah, I'll be there, like, for sure, like, it's crazy. So I, uh, I, uh, I get a couple of camera people, I tell my team, we have to go there and all, and I go, super, second EV expo. <laughs> for can I can I swear on this yes, podcast? You can. For fuck's sake. <laughs> it is the most disappointing piece of shit event or or gathering of things that I've ever seen. I mean, apart from one uh, automaker which was which had some potential, which was a known automaker, I'm not gonna name. They didn't even bother covering up the Chinese signages on their car. They would put a <laughs> sticker on top of that. You could see the Chinese name below it. I mean, it do that at least. I mean, look, I know that. There's this, there's this drive to make mm. whatever little money you can. That's a great thing. I mean, you know, you need to do that. But the kind of mediocrity that, I mean, you talked about what, how million plus auto rickshaws, electric auto rickshaws, name one that's decent. It's all rubbish. So this was a few years ago. Sadly, we've since then ridden a couple of electric scooters who've come out in this big way and said, uh, we're doing these huge uh, India investments and R&D. Bullshit. It's all literally copy paste. I mean, we found the bloody scooter on the internet at 30,000 rupees. You can import a thousand of them at 25,000 rupees and you can sell them. They're selling them for, your, for a, a lakh. It's the exact same scooter. They haven't even changed the logo on it. <laughs> it. It was absurd. So there is so much absolute rubbish in the industry. And this will always be the case. There will always be this, this um, I have, it's probably more than one is to 10 as a ratio. Uh, but it always, it, there'll always be, um, what do you call it? What's the term for it? Collateral damage, sadly. Uh, if they're good enough, if they're really good enough, they'll always be successful. If they're good to a point where they're just good, mildly, I don't think they're going to make it. Uh, but yes, we are going to see names that we've never heard of come on board and just completely revolutionize. I mean, look at Tesla. 
from what they were 10 years ago uh, absolutely or 15 years ago more more specifically yeah. with the roadster mm. to what they are today and what a jump it's been and what a phenomenal you might like elon you might not like elon i think he's a rock star the fact that one person has the actual cha- uh, the ability to do change the way he does but well, he's earned it isn't he you like him or not is another factor <clears throat> but you have to respect the guy totally yeah. so uh, i mean yeah there's this, this huge if we're on this moment of ex- I mean, it, it's just a revol- elect- mm. i mean it's a revolution it's a mobility revolution coming it's not necessarily an electric revolution it's a mobility revolution so there will be as you said there will be a clean up people who don't yes, cut there will be a clean up just, uh, there will be yeah. these big names who fall mm. sadly so i want to tease out the whole concept of the world's biggest scooter factory in india at yeah. 10 million a year uh versus the reality of 50 60000 makes all from the biggest factory today uh, uh which is which is doing a great job uh, hero electric uh in in and has been doing so for 10 years yeah i want i want to tease out your opinion here <laughs> <laughs> uh he's not been very kind to us hasn't he? has he recently he, to the uh, journalism fraternity uh that will not uh, affect my uh uh, uh judgment though it's our job to be uh it's our job to put our personal I mean, we, we might rant on it on twitter but when it actually comes to giving our own opinion it's our job to keep our personal biases aside right uh, i haven't ridden one but i have booked one uh the same way i booked the model 3 when it came out and not knowing whether the weather will ever see it i did sell my booking later on and make a little bit of money on it it's different but uh i have booked an ola scooter because i use scooters it is in bombay despite me owning more than a dozen cars my absolute primary mode of transport is a scooter and it's always been that i and look i use a scooter as an appliance not as a vehicle i don't get attached to my scooters okay every 3 years when i hit 10000 kilometers or every 2 years 3 years whatever i sell it off and i buy a new one i have gone through three of the same exact scooters back to back to back because i like them i mean you know i got went through 300 years 200 activas and now i'm on an entoc and uh, now i think i'm ready to buy an electric vehicle because now as of 3 months ago i have the capacity to put a charger where i live in 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 my house in bombay so then why not so the ola was a great choice it looks cool i mean you have the color option and stuff uh i think uh i think he went a little overboard with his his bravado and his marketing uh there is potential of making a great deal of i mean i think if he just reels it down a little bit and does uh, look there is potential in that in that auto make or whatever as a company they has there is potential right we've seen that they have the the funds to do it they have the space to do it and it's a cool looking vehicle whether it rides really well or not i haven't in it yet so i'm not going to comment on that but it looks cool and that's half the battle one for a for a two wheeler to be honest is there a reason you booked an ola instead oh, yeah. of aether Okay. It was fine but Aether was uh, there was no booking. And I've ridden the Aether, it's phenomenal. Uh I just don't fit well on an Aether. Mm. I I it hits my knees. It is what it okay. is. Uh I love them. I really like them. Uh, I have several friends who bought them. Excellent. So now I'm going to ask you a question that we normally end the podcast with. Uh and it's the same question we ask every talent that comes on the show. And it's a very frivolous question, Cyrus, mm. but uh, it always gives a pointed answer. So I'm going to put that to you and The question is if you had the opportunity to be the prime minister of India for one day just mm. one day and you could make any decision you wanted oh. to help faster adoption of electric vehicles in India specifically mm. what would that uh, decision be uh i'd put in a policy to allow um, ev swaps uh, as an ic to ev swaps so sort of fast track that because uh, it's happening we've seen it happen you've done it with a yeah, i mean it's it's very the retrofit you're talking about yeah, the retrofit yeah, yeah. Hmm. um that's interesting actually because it bring to life a large segment of cars that are unused today yeah. for example all of these gypsies coming out of service from the army could actually be retrofitted to electric and go back to forest service um there's so many other applications for them that you would not that's ever thought about idea. Hmm. that's actually a damn good idea yeah uh that and also i think i think uh, just the look uh, the automaker needs to be given something in return for all the effort they take let's be honest okay you've put in uh now people will call me uh, they say they, they'll say I'm siding with the automakers I am right because we see both sides of uh, and we know how much the, the, the industry is struggling yes they're making great amounts of or whatever record sales every few months or whatever but that doesn't mean they're necessarily making a lot of money 
or there are some automakers that are really really struggling and some that shouldn't be here anymore uh, but uh, i think a blanket uh just a blanket tax break on some sort of evs for five years would really fasten up just speeding up the adoption process and then you'd have these players coming in which you really need uh but i think what tesla is asking for is a little unfair just for them if there is a tax break to be given i think it should be across the board um tesla could have easily done this whole 2500 unit start with that i mean this is just a little stubborn i guess uh, although i haven't met the indian team i really would like to if, if anybody's listening to me from tesla uh, please reach out <laughs> it's cy at powerdrift.com it's very easy uh, no but uh, i think that it needs to be some uh, some sort of sort of leeway given if not to the car makers at least to the scooter makers so, because that's going to be the first thing that falls right you, you aren't going to have ev cars on the market uh, it's not going to be a switch that pops the two wheelers are going to be the swift switch that pops almost has almost has it's very close to doing it but it's still a while away uh, again mainstream makers like honda need to come with an electric vehicle till honda doesn't do it till the hero doesn't do, i mean hero the 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 bike maker hero doesn't do it um it won't really happen yes acer can be there as a as a tesla equivalent which is so much more expensive than the activa is or uh, ola can be around or whoever you know bajaj can over the chetak which i think Uh, needs a bit of a rehash in any case. Um, till these bigger automakers decide to sort of grow, sort of s- shake off their slumber and come in, I think we aren't going to have. That. And I think the government needs to just sort of uh, have a little bit of a easier view on them. Well, Cyrus, it has been very informative. I'm sure all of our listeners really enjoyed this very candid conversation. It's been lovely. It's been lovely. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, very appreciated. I know it's a long, long time coming. Been promising it for a while now. but better late than never i guess yes thank you for having made the time we look forward to having you back absolutely and i look forward to driving that fiat again uh, the one that's parked below excellent thanks aris you're welcome